I was fortunate enough to receive an early copy of the new Age of Sigmar starter set from Games Workshop, and that's of course Dominion. And the first thing that I did upon receiving the box was build one of the new flavors of Stormcast Eternal, the Vindicta. Compared to the original Stormcast models, this new armor style is much more light and the bearer has a much better posture rather than the wide-legged, chunky action figure style of the original Liberators. These miniatures are much better proportioned whilst remaining in the superhuman category. But despite these changes, they're still a little too clean cut, especially when compared to the characterful new Auric models. But this pristineness does provide a blank canvas in which to add some extra detail. I'm Pete the Wargamer, and in this video, I'll be showing you some tips for converting and painting some grimdark Stormcast. I'll be giving this guide two dead animal bits out of five. There is a little sculpting and scratch building, but no components are required from other kits. So, I began with a Vindicta, but you can easily apply some of these extra details to other Stormcast too. In their new lore, the Vindictives are created to operate for longer campaigns outside the support of Azir. But the armor is a little too immaculate for an individual who has been slogging it through a long campaign. To remedy this, I decided to add some dents to the armor. This was quite simple to achieve and involved scraping away a very small part of the armor to create a flat section. By repeating this a couple of times around one of these new facets, it created the appearance of a buckled section of armor. I did this a few areas where I'd expect more damage to be taken. This included the knees and the torso. In addition to these dents on the flatter sections of armor, I also cut away small divots from around the edges and also added some deeper indentation to represent areas where a bladed attack had been stopped. Where you apply these dents and dings is up to you and will vary from model to model, but just don't apply too much damage. It can be tempting, but your model will just look like they've been rolled down a rocky hill. The Vindictus shield comes with an embossed face of Sigmar, but I wanted a little more control over what symbol is displayed, so it needed to go. I began by cutting away small chunks at first, which removed the bulk of the detailing. What was left was then shaved away to create a completely smooth shield surface. I also added a little damage to the edges around the outside, which left me with the following. With the adjustments made to the armor completed, I could glue together the main body, but I opted to keep the shield separate. Generally speaking, it's always best to complete these kinds of trims and customizations before you build the model. It just helps to avoid accidentally damaging the model as you're making those cuts. The next step saw me returning to the shield. Historically, shields would often be canvas covered or laminated, which created a series of stacked layers. As such, it would be expected that damage to these surfaces would peel back these coverings, which is exactly what I worked on next. But first I need to cut and mix up a little bit of green stuff. To create the illusion that there are multiple layers to the shield, I first rolled out the green stuff into a thin sausage. It was about the same width of the inner shield section, and this was placed at a slight angle across the surface. I then smoothed out the top edge of this roll into the rest of the shield. I made sure to use plenty of Vaseline here to help prevent the putty from sticking to my tools and getting pulled up. I spread out the green stuff as far up the shield as I could get it, which created a really smooth transition from the top of the shield down to the edge of the green stuff. This edge was looking a little clean though, so I roughed things up by making a series of vaguely vertical cuts to create some ragged strips. I moved these around a little and pressed some folds into a few of these strips just to give them that torn canvas appearance. Which left me with the following. Even though the top and bottom of the inner parts of the shield are at the same level, once I paint these two sections up in different colors, they will appear as two different layered materials, completing the effect. While the green stuff was curing, I had one last adjustment to make. I'm a big fan of tilt shields, and I thought that adding one to this miniature would be a quick way of adding a little extra detail. To create one of these was incredibly simple and involved starting out with some one millimeter thick plaster card. I cut out a rectangle shape that was about 5mm in width, but longer than I actually needed. I then roughly shaped out one end of the rectangle into a rounded point before smoothing it flat with a file. This created the bottom end of my mini heater shaped tilt shield. I finished off by cutting down the length and smoothing out the top with a file once again. 
This was then glued to the front side of the Vindictor's right pauldron, completing the conversion. All that needed to be done now was to paint. I started off with a primer, the ever important first step in painting. This not only helps to give the model a uniform starting colour, but also provides a much better surface to apply the paint to. I chose a grey primer as it will massively help with the coverage of that first metallic layer. But while the colour is important, the method of application is not. I'm using an airbrush primer here, specifically a mix of Vallejo's black and grey surface primers. But how you apply it is up to you. Be it brushed on, aerosol or an airbrush like I did, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that your coverage is complete and even. When I was deciding on a scheme, I wanted something that was a little more grounded in reality, which admittedly is an unusual thing to say when you're talking about reincarnated lightning riding superhumans. But I ultimately settled on a plain steel, and to start this, I began with some lead voucher. The key to getting good metallic sheen is a few thin layers, and the way I achieved this was to first water down some lead voucher on my wet palette. Roughly one part paint to one part water works well. I applied this mixture to the entirety of the armor and the weapon, which covered the majority of the miniature's surface. I tried not to overspill onto the few non-metallic areas, but this didn't matter too much as I would be painting over it later on. After my first layer had been applied and had fully dried, a hairdryer does help speed this process up, I then applied my second. The first layer had already covered quite nicely, and this was in part due to the colour of the primer. Silver is essentially just a shiny grey, so when I applied over a surface that has a similar tone, you're not having to apply enough layers to block the undercoat from being visible underneath. However, if you want really shiny metals, then applying at least two layers is the way to go. So I did exactly that until I was left with the following. At this stage, in a lot of grim dark painting guides, you'll be prompted to grab yourself some streaking grime or similar oil-based paint, but I'm going to be showing you how to get that high contrast style with just regular old Citadel paints. And the first of these is Norn Oil. This was applied straight from the pot, and the only care I took here was to ensure that I didn't allow the wash to pull too much in one place. Just keep working the wash around the surface with your brush until it's fairly evenly dispersed. Now these kinds of washes are great for getting that first bit of shading. They flow into all those nooks and crannies, and when they dry, they look like areas of shadow. But for a high contrast style, washes alone aren't enough. We will also need to directly paint on some of the shadows, and this is done with what is called a glaze. You can create a glaze by taking a paint, about in black in my case, and really thinning it out with water. Whereas the lead voucher was about one to one mix, this is instead closer to three parts water to one part paint. You want to create a translucent mixture here, but you don't want it to be too runny. We're not looking to create a wash. This is so that when applied to the model surface, it just subtly adjusts the tone. As I'm using a black paint, it of course darkens it down. I focus this application to areas that I would expect to be in shadow. I imagine the light source above the model, and so focus the paint mostly to those recessed areas and overhangs that face downwards rather than upwards. Sometimes holding your phone torch directly above the model can help with visualizing this. The layers of this glaze are very subtle, so you will have to apply several layers in order to get a pure black, but by building things up slowly, you will have much more control over where and how much the paint is applied. At this stage, my armor was looking nice and dark. The shadows were well defined already, but I really wanted to push that contrast further. To counteract the dark recesses, I opted to use some of the very bright Stormhost Silver as an edge highlight. This was applied to just the hard edges and corners of the armor. By adding these thin, bright silver lines, they create further distinction from the darker shadows, helping to create depth whilst maintaining that dark appearance. The final step in painting the armor involve adding a little bit of surface rust. This will complement the dents that I added earlier and help to build up the impression that these Stormcasts have been operating outside of Azir for a long time. Creating the surface rust involve creating a filter, but that's just a fancy way of saying we're going to be heavily thinning out some Doomball Brown with water. This time we want to create a mixture of 10 parts water to one part paint essentially creating something more akin to a weak wash. This will work differently than a wash though, 
as I apply it over the, all the armor surfaces, in a uniform amount, it will subtly adjust the color. It will give it a very slight, barely perceptible reddish tinge that will help to create the effect of surface rush just starting to form. You can, of course, focus this directly into certain areas if you want to really push that rust effect even further. With the armor completed, there were just a few more metallic areas to focus on, which included some of the shoulder symbols and the parts of the spear. I wanted to give these areas a bronze appearance, and so naturally, I started off with some warp block bronze. Most of these areas had been base coated by the lead belcher earlier, so the application was fairly straightforward, but again, I thinned out the paint a little and applied a couple of layers to get some good, solid coverage. To create a little edge definition in these areas, I then applied a highlight of Balthazar Gold. As this was the final metallic paint to be applied to the miniature, I made sure to thoroughly clean out my paint water and brushes afterwards. This just prevents those metallic flakes from getting into my other paints. To finish off the bronze areas, another wash of non oil was applied. Again, this flowed into the recesses and then added some shading, but also helped to desaturate the areas too, helping them to blend into that grim dark aesthetic a little more. The next area to tackle were the leather and cloth areas of the model. These included the straps, blade sheath, boots, the areas of fabric between the armor panels and the tilt shield. All of these parts were base coated in a couple of layers of a bad and black, once again keeping up that dark and muted tone. To give these areas a little definition, I then applied some Corvus Black. This layer of paint was applied so that the surfaces were covered but the recesses were left as the pure black. Alternatively, I could have base coated them with Corvus Black and then applied another wash, which would have achieved a similar result but wouldn't have offered me quite as much control. I finished off painting the leather and cloth areas by creating a mixture of Corvus Black and Dawn Yellow, mixed in roughly equal parts. The result is a warm grey colour that is a little lighter than the Corvus Black base coat. This was carefully applied to just the edges of those aforementioned areas, picking out the creases and folds in the fabrics. By this point, most of the model has been painted and all that's left is the shield and the wrapping around the weapon's handles. So far, the vast majority of the model is dark, so I wanted to choose a color that would really stand out against that. Ultimately, I settled on Morgast Bone. This highly pigmented bone color is the perfect brightness to create that distinction. So, like with all the previous base coats, I thinned it out into a one-to-one -one mixture of paint and water and applied a couple of layers to the shield and to the handles. I also added a fine diagonal line across the tilt shield as well, but you can choose your own design here. The problem with scraping away that shield embossing is that the shield is looking a little bland. So to remedy this, I made use of some transfers, but to prep the surface, I first needed to apply a gloss varnish. I chose to use some odd coat and apply two thin layers to that middle section of the shield. This will create a much smoother surface to apply that transfer to. Speaking of which, I chose to use this particular symbol from a Stormcast Eternal transfer sheet. I cut out the symbol from the sheet and left it in a shallow pool of water for around 30 seconds or so. Once the symbol was starting to lift from the backing paper, I then transferred it to the shield. I used a damp brush to tease the transfer from the paper and then to gently adjust the position. Once I was happy with the placement, I left it to dry. To help remove that ghosting effect around the edge of the symbol and to create a more painted on effect, I grabbed some Microsol and applied a layer of this over the top of the transfer. This stuff is a mild solvent that helps to soften the sheet and allows it to better form against that surface. I allowed this to dry before finishing off with another coat of odd coat to seal it all into place. I felt that the symbol was looking a little flat and bland though, so I used some of that earlier Corvus Black and Dawn Yellow mix to add a bit of a highlight to the comet. This is entirely optional though. With the transfer in place, I could begin to work on some weathering effects. The first of these was just a simple wash of Agrax Earthshade. This was applied over both the shield and also the wrappings around the weapon, essentially anywhere that we painted with Morgast Bone. 
The wash will create a slight staining effect on the shield, whilst also helping to build up a little definition in some of those finer details. The Agrax Earthshade created a very subtle change in surface colour, but I wanted to push this a bit further and to create the appearance of dirt and grime. So, like with the earlier glazes and filters, I added some water to Rhinox Hide to create a wash-like consistency. With a kind of stippling motion, I applied this paint to the shield surface and focused it into small clumps of irregularly shaped and sized patches. I built this up until I was happy with the dirt and grime that I had added. My final step in painting was to apply an edge highlight of Screaming Skull. This was applied to the edges of the wrapping and also over some of those ragged edges at the bottom of the shield too. And with that, the painting was done, but the model wasn't ready just yet. I first applied a matte varnish. This serves the double purpose of sealing in and protecting that paintwork, whilst also removing some of that glossy sheen that was created by the washes. I again use my airbrush for this, but like with the primer coat, feel free to use an aerosol or brush on varnish instead, because how you apply it doesn't matter. Okay, so we've converted and painted our Vindicta, but we still have no base, so let's quickly make one. I began with a 40mm base and superglued some chunks of ripped up cork floor tile into it. These are great for creating the appearance of rocks, and if you're interested in a more in-depth guide and working with these, I'll include a link above. These rocks were then primed black and then dry brushed with some Corvus Black. Dry brushing involves taking a fairly large brush, dipping it into some paint and then wiping away some of the excess onto a paper towel. When this brush is lightly dragged over these highly textured surfaces, the paint only accumulates onto the raised details. It's essentially a really quick way of painting and highlighting at the same time. After the first layer of Corvus Black was applied, I then dry brushed a little more of that Corvus Black and Dawn Yellow mixture over the top as well. At this stage, I then glued the Vindicta to the base, but to ensure that the glue could do its job, I first scraped away some of the paint from the underside of the miniature's feet and also from the base where the model would stand. Once done, I used my plastic glue to make things permanent. Great, so now we have this flat black floor punctuated by a few rocks. To fill in those gaps, I used some textured paint, specifically some of Vallejo's Dark Earth Texture, but again, feel free to use whatever earth texture you have to hand. This paste-like substance was painted into all of the empty space. Just take care around the feet, unless of course you're looking to muddy up the Stormcast boots. Once the base is covered, leave it to dry fully for an hour or so. The detail in the earth texture was then further enhanced with a wash of non oil before being dry brushed with a light brown paint such as Gorthor Brown. I cleaned up the rim of the base with a little Abaddon Black and applied a little more matte varnish to seal things in. Finally, a small tuft of grass was super glued into place and I was done. So let's take a look at the finished model. And here we have the completed Vindicta, converted and painted in a grim dark style. This dark high contrast style is just a really fun way to build and paint your miniatures, especially when you're tackling traditionally clean cut and pristine warriors such as Stormcast Eternals. It was also a nice return to doing a painting guide too. So let me know if you enjoyed this hybrid painting conversion guide and leave me your ideas for what you might like to see me tackle in this grim dark style in the future. And with that, the final thing to say is a massive thank you to my supporters. Currently, my top supporters on Patreon are Jonathan Hart, Stuart Smith, Berserker, Daniel Dowling, Gestaig Panzer, Jake, Jeremy Kaup, Jesse Smith, Casper Strand, Lyconian Primarch, Merrick, Mr. Grimm, Raphael Beiruthi, Nice OJ, and Swedsman. So, a big thank you to you guys, and if you also support me on Patreon, buy me a coffee or you just use my affiliate links, then your help is what allows me to buy the kits and materials required to build these kinds of conversions. So, until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.